Good morning, friends. My wife Stephanie and the kiddos have been really excited about planting some seeds to grow vegetables for the summertime. And so I went out to Meijer several weeks ago and I bought some tomato seeds, some cilantro, some parsley, basil, sweet peppers, and things like that. And we had some potting soil. And you're gonna see here now the kids feverishly planting those seeds, putting the soil in the cups. And they're really excited about seeing these vegetables grow. Takes preparations. So we have to have good soil, some potting soil. We're gonna put some water in those cups. We're gonna plant those seeds nice and softly deep down in that soil. Make sure that they get some sunlight. And then out of that preparation comes waiting. Waiting and waiting. So Carson, you want to plant some seeds? Yeah, and I want to plant, plant some some beans. Some beans? I want to plant pretty beautiful flowers like my eyelashes. And I want to... Are you ready to plant seeds? Yes! We have some sweet pepper, some green bell pepper seeds, we have some, oh, let's see, some cilantro, parsley, and we have some tomato, spinach, and more cilantro. I love peppers. There's so much water. I love it so much. So, we're gonna shovel it into these. Can you help? Yeah. So we're gonna put the seeds in the soil and then we're gonna to have to wait. But waiting time is not wasted we time because preparation is really important. Oh, These are tiny little seeds and you have to just put one or two Oh my each. goodness. You ready? No, I put mine in. Whoop. Hey, that's very Here, buddy. I got like this tiny. It's in there. So amateur farmer Michael here. The kiddos and I have placed seeds in the soil. They've learned a little bit about preparation. They probably are expecting the plants to suddenly pop out of the soil tomorrow or the next day and give them tomatoes and cilantro and all kinds of things. But what they're gonna learn is that this is gonna take some time. There's gonna be a waiting period before there will be any vegetables to eat from these trays with lots of seeds. They dumped the seeds in some of these. I think I'm gonna have about six or seven tomato plants in one cup hole. This is gonna be kind of interesting. Now I'm anticipating about three or four days into this, Everlyn and Hudson and Carson are gonna be going, why aren't our vegetables growing off the plants yet? And they're not even gonna see a tiny little green leaf yet. It's gonna take some time. You and I are, are in a season of waiting, of waiting and waiting. For more than eight weeks now, we have been waiting in this safe at home or shelter in place mode here in the state of Michigan. And we're in this time of just waiting to see what will happen and waiting to see what God is going to do in all of this. So I wanted to ask you and me, and ask myself and ask you this question this morning, what are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting? Oswald Chambers said this, that God has a purpose in the waiting. God orders our steps and he also orders the stops. And right now it feels like so many things are on hold and we're in this waiting period. And there are a lot of different things that we could do while we're waiting. But I want you to know this, that waiting time doesn't have to be wasted time. Because in fact, God who orders our steps also orders the stops in our lives. And so right out of the gate here, we need to ask ourselves this question, what are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting? Now in this series through the Acts of the Apostles that we could also call the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, we're gonna see now those first followers of Jesus waiting. They have received this commission from Jesus Christ 
and this promise of power to come. And so they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come because Jesus had instructed them to stay in the city in Luke's account of Jesus' words and works, his gospel. The, he said, he recorded these words. It, it says this in verse 45, 46, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high and so jesus has given his disciples the promise that the holy spirit is going to come upon them and they will have power he said this in acts so that's luke's second book the acts of the apostles he wrote the gospel of luke and the acts of the apostles most of you probably know that but some of you may not and so he said in in verse 8 of chapter 1, and we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you shall be, you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest part of the earth, to the farthest reaches of the globe. The gospel will go to this, those first followers of Jesus, and then that includes us. For all who have believed in Jesus Christ are indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we have power. But those first followers of Jesus are waiting. They're in this waiting period. They're staying in the city. You're staying in your home. <laughs> so what do they do? What do the disciples do in this time of waiting? And how does that guide us then in three steps for waiting so that waiting doesn't have to be wasted time? So look with me in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, where we're going to see three guides for what we can do while we're waiting. And so in Acts chapter 1, turn with me there. If you're not there, I'm going to wait for you. Acts chapter 1. Now it says this in verse 14, and we covered a little bit of this last week, but I want to dial in now verse 14 of Acts chapter 1. These, with all one mind, these all with one mind, that is, he's named off the 11 remaining disciples, with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And so preparation for God's mission starts with what? With unity of mind. Preparation for God's mission requires unity of mind, a oneness of mind. So if we want to be effective, if we want to bear fruit, fruitful preparation for God's mission requires that we are one in mind, that we need to focus on our purpose. There are so many different purposes that, that believers individually and that local churches collectively can, can get involved in. We can start lots of programs and events and structures and all kinds of things. We can get involved in political movements, as many churches or the church has throughout church history. But ultimately, I want all of us to remember this, that our purpose is not a nationalism of a particular government, no matter what country you might be in. For us, our purpose as a church is not American nationalism. And it's not some kind of programmatic commercialization it's disciple multiplication. That's our purpose, that we follow Jesus and we stand on the witness stand and we proclaim what Jesus has said and what Jesus has done so that everybody can hear how they can receive new life in him, that we are disciples who make disciples. We should be a church that is reproducing. So as those seeds go into the ground, what happens? There's amazing analogies all throughout the natural world that God has created and fit right into the walk of following Jesus Christ. The seeds go into the ground and over time in good soil with water and sunlight, the little plants grow up and then you get a tomato. But inside that tomato are dozens and dozens of more seeds and those seeds can go into the ground. 
And then out of that, more plants and more tomatoes and more tomatoes and more tomatoes. And so, as one follower of Jesus said many years ago in this ministry called The Navigators that he began, he said, we're born to reproduce. We're born to reproduce. You and I, if you know Jesus Christ, if you've been born again from above, then you are called to reproduce, to be a disciple who makes disciples. And so preparation, fruitful ultimately, preparation for God's mission requires that we have a unity of mind, which is to focus on our purpose, which is disciple multiplication, not American nationalism, <laughs> not some kind of programmatic commercialization, not building some, so, some kind of giant organization, but disciple multiplication. And so what then leads from that first step of preparation for God's mission requires that we have a unity of mind so we focus on our purpose, which is disciple multiplication. The next step is right here in this text in verse 14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. And so clearly that fruitful preparation for God's mission requires, number two, dependency on prayer. Because through prayer, we express our dependency on God, our submission to his will, that we bow under his kingship that he is the Lord, he is the master, we are not. We're crying out to him for wisdom because we don't have the direction, the wisdom in and of ourselves and our finite puny brains, even all of us together cannot make the right decision in our own strength and our own wisdom. But instead, we pray how Jesus has called us to pray that his will in heaven would come down and be lived out through our lives here on earth, that God's wisdom from heaven, from above, would guide our decisions, our steps here on earth. So we are focusing on a purpose, which is disciple multiplication, and we're focusing on our dependency on God, dependency in prayer. And that's what the men and women were doing while they were waiting. This is like the soil, the seed, the water, the sunlight to be fully prepared for God's mission to be fruitful. I think that even right now, God has us, and maybe all the other churches across the globe in this season of waiting for a time of incredible fruitfulness. That's why we are, we are so united. God is bringing us into this oneness of mind as a local church. I've seen it like never before on his mission and serving one another, striving together for the sake of the gospel like never before. It's, it's honing that, that right down to the fact that we are here to live out the message of Jesus Christ and to make disciples. And so we're all looking at that same bead right now like never before. And the next step in that is to have dependency on prayer, that we need God's guidance in our lives and we cannot do this without the power that he provides. And so fruitful preparation for God's mission requires that we have a unity of mind. We focus on our purpose, which is disciple multiplication. And number two, fruitful preparation for God's mission requires us to have a dependency on prayer that we request God's power, God's wisdom, and we praise God for his provision, for we are relying on his power. And then here's the next step here. I want you to see in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out and all the children covered their eyes. Uh, what is Pastor Michael reading from the Bible? 
And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field was called Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, this is Psalm 69, verse 25, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it and let another man take his office. That's Psalm 109, verse eight. Therefore, it is necessary, Peter says, that of the men who have accompanied us all, the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. To go to his own place, which would be death for Judas and rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, and rejection of God's promised Messiah, rejection of God's plan. That's what happened with Judas. I want us to zero in on this, though. Here is an important interpretive move when you are trying to understand Acts. You have to determine whether it's descriptive or prescriptive, okay? Is this describing simply something that the disciples did for part of the narrative and illustration of what happened in that birth of the church and the disciples going out from Jerusalem, Judea, etc.? Or is it prescriptive? For example, we're going to see something in the, the last verse of this chapter that is descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive. Uh, we're going to see something later on of Paul taking boats on his missionary journeys. Is that descriptive or prescriptive? So should we take boats on our missionary journeys? Should we go first to a synagogue? before preaching anywhere else, because that's what Paul did first. He went to synagogue to preach there. No, those are descriptive elements. So in order to, to line up with God's word correctly across all time of how the book of Acts applies to us, we need to determine whether it's descriptive or prescriptive. Now that I've kind of caught your attention, I hope, let's read the last verse 26 of Acts chapter 1. It says this, And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11, 11 apostles. 11 apostles. Now, what's that all about? Now, should that mean that Pastor Dale, Pastor Keegan, and I, and the elders, when we need to make a decision, that we should get some dice out and roll the dice on the table and say, huh? Well, <laughs> no, not exactly. Here's how one professor of mine said this. He said, Stanley Toussaint. Professor Dallas Seminary said, when you have two equal choices in an amoral decision, flip a coin. What is he getting at? Well, first, we need to notice that the apostles prayed. So this goes back to that, to that second step there. To have fruitful preparation for God's mission, we have dependency on prayer. We request, we request God's wisdom and praise him for his provision. Now, in the first century Jewish culture, it was common to cast lots. And they were doing this as believers in God, believers in the one true God. And so they prayed that God, through the means of casting of lots, would point direction in this decision. Because they had two candidates who were supposedly, as we know, of, of equal character, both worthy people, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias, these two faithful men who'd walked with Jesus. They, they fit the requirements. And so the, the disciples make this decision based upon prayer and then based upon the direction that they believe God would give them as they cast lots. So for us in our context, we pray and then we make the wise choice about two amoral. That is, it's, it's, it's not uh, something that's evil. It's not a right or wrong decision because in the pages of scripture, for example, God isn't going to tell you which company to work for or which address of house you should buy. And so we pray, we seek God's wisdom, and then we trust that he's leading us in those steps to make the wise choice. And so that is how we, we move from the, the, tr the truth and the story of scripture 
across all time. The timeless truth is that we pray, we trust in God's direction as we pray that he's going to guide us with his eye and guide our steps. And then we make the choice, the, the wise choice, as we seek to follow him. Listen carefully now, friends. The rain is starting to fall. And so those seeds that we planted in the soil will experience the next step in preparation from soil now to the water that they need to start to germinate and begin that process of growth. Now, what's the next step here in our process of preparation for God's mission? What are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting? We're going to look at the third one now in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. We've read through this, but I want us to zero in and see exactly what's happening here. It says this in verse 15. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering about 120 people were there, and said, Brothers, or brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And so this third step in our preparation for God's mission requires study of scripture, that we lean on his word. Peter is leaning on the Old Testament scriptures, Psalm 67, which we read just a few moments ago, and Psalm 109, verse 8. He's quoting these scriptures, and in Peter's statement, is defense of the inspiration of scripture itself because he said the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So hundreds of years before, God the Holy Spirit spoke the words of God through David. The Holy Spirit, that's third person of the Trinity, inspired David to write these very words. And Peter saying, this is talking about Judas. And so our doctrine of scripture is lifted up here that we understand that these are not just pages of history accounting an adventurous tale about something that may be interesting. No, this is the word of God. Every word on, on every page is God breathed, is inspired of God. God the Holy Spirit superintended the human authors to write the words on those original manuscripts. And now we have, through the transmission process, the translations of those manuscripts out of Greek and Hebrew parts and Aramaic so that we have the word of God. But there's even more than that. So Peter is giving us an apologetic, a defense of the inspiration of scripture. But he's also pointing out details. Luke is giving us through this record of Peter's words, evidence that his account of the Acts of the Apostles is true. Because the people who originally received this journal from Dr. Luke could have gone back and found these places and found many of these people and asked them exactly what happened to confirm the testimony given here. And so keep that in mind. If you have doubts or questions about the validity or veracity of scripture, the authenticity of scripture, the Bible over and over exposes itself to be tested, meaning it presents itself with all kinds of names and places and happenings that can be put to the test according to history. And so this is why it says, for he was counted among us. And this man, this is a parenthetical clause in verse 18 and 19, this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. This field was called Hapeldama, that is the field of blood. And so people could have gone back and found exactly where this happened, asked the people about the purchase of the property to determine exactly what occurred. And Luke is recording it just as it happened, guided by the Holy Spirit to do this for the original readers. And it's written for our benefit all the way down to the 21st century. And so preparation for God's mission requires study of scripture. It's more than just reading it for information's sake, but that it would guide us, that we'd lean on his word, just as Peter is leaning on the words of scripture for guidance, for testimony of God's work through this whole situation. So you and I lean on God's word. We study it to follow it, to 
follow God's word as our guide for every circumstance of life. And so Peter follows this and so we lean on God's word together. And this is why we call ourselves Mayfair Bible Church. We don't worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. But we believe that the God of the Bible gave us his word so that we would lean on it, so that we'd follow it, so that we would study it to show ourselves approved as workmen that don't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly understanding it, under, understanding its component parts, interpreting it, accurately according to the author's intention, the capital A author, who is God himself. And so if we want to be prepared for a fruitful life on God's mission, it began with a unity of mind, which guides us to focus on our purpose. Those first followers of Jesus had a oneness of mind, a unity of mind. And so we too, as a local church, need to be focused on our purpose, which is disciple multiplication. And number two, to have a fruitful preparation for God's mission, to do the right thing while we're waiting, is to have a dependency on prayer, to persevere in prayer, to call upon God for his wisdom about the decisions that we're facing here on earth, and to have his power to request God to give us the words to speak, to pray for our neighbors, everybody that we come in contact with, to tell them about the good news of Jesus, what Jesus said, what Jesus did, points toward who he, who he is. So we, we pray through that whole process. We persevere in prayer. And then what we just covered, number three, this third step, is that faithful preparation for God's mission requires study of scripture. We lean on his word. So as you are still at this shelter in place mode, staying at home most of the time, working from home, inculcate the message of God's word. Soak in the truth of God's word. See the parallel passages, how the Old Testament informs and, and guides us to interpret the New Testament and how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. All these component parts fitting together to study, to show yourselves, everybody, not just for pastors here, to study to so show yourself approved, a workman of the word rightly handling God's word, his word of truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, in this high priestly prayer, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The truth sets us free. The truth gives us hope. The truth gives us joy. The truth renews our strength and, and, and it stimulates our faith, increases our belief in God. As you were struggling with questions or doubts, don't veer away from the word, instead dive into it. For in God's word, we find the truth that satisfies our souls. So we lean on his word. Those are preparation steps for God's mission. Now, many, now several years ago, our family was driving down to Florida. When we lived in North Carolina, we took a road trip. And we were passing through Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a big city. And I don't know the roadways. I've only driven through Jacksonville a few times. And we were driving along the highway. Everything was cruising along just fine. And then suddenly, through a series of road work maneuvers on, the, on this highway, I found myself just pushed on to an exit ramp down into a neighborhood, a rather sketchy looking neighborhood. And I had no idea where I was. Our map app on our phone was going bananas. Reroute, reroute. <laughs> and I'm looking at Stephanie. How did we end up here? It was a big detour. And right now, this COVID-19 crisis is like a giant detour in our lives, isn't it? It's a disruption to the normal. Our normal routine of just work and rest, recreation, worship has all been detoured. And you might be throwing up your hands and going, how in the world did we end up here? God, what are you doing in all of this? God has a plan. That waiting time is not wasted time. If we're using the waiting time to prepare for his mission, for what he has in store on the other side of this, and even what he's doing within it, within you and within me. So the seeds go in the soil. The soil receives 
water, and sunlight, warmth. Preparation to eventually grow that little seed through the germination process into a plant that bears good fruit. Think about this individually now. How are you handling this waiting time? Are you focusing on your purpose? Are you persevering in prayer? Are you studying scripture, leaning on his word? Am I? And yet so busy with distractions and even just wasting time, frittering it away through all kinds of things. Could just be watching endless hours of TV shows or movies on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus. Now, I'm not saying that watching a show here and there or enjoying a film is wrong or sinful. Or just, but if we, if we just pour over that to the neglect of what God wants to do in and through us through faithful preparation for his mission, then we're missing out. We're missing out on the growth process Instead of waiting time being a fruitful time, it could be a wasted time. Maybe it's endless scrolling through social media and there's just news, 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 more panic, anxiety, fear, <sighs> and you're exhausted from that. Maybe it's time to just put that down, phone, tablet, shut off the TV, <laughs> and open up God's word by your knees in prayer. Renew your mind on the focus that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's time for that. Yeah. And so God has called us in this time of waiting to grow. And that it's a time to not look at the situation, this major detour, as a denial, but as a God-ordained delay. As one pastor said, God's delays are not God's denials. He has a purpose in this process for you and for me individually and collectively as Mayfair Bible Church. Mayfair, as a church, we're never going to go back to normal the way it was before because God has done something extraordinary in us through this process. That there's this new whole outlook on what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be living and what does it look like to be a witness for Jesus Christ, to be a follower of Jesus when the church is apart, even though the church is alive. God is going to, I believe, propel us toward one another together and out into our community to be involved in disciple multiplication like never before. And we can be a part of that even right now through faithful preparation in the waiting. This is why we also last Sunday launched this opportunity for every single person in Mayfair to be part of the Bless Every Home initiative, this Bless Every Home plan. It's simply receiving a list of names of your neighbors to pray for your neighbors and a process of how to have conversations about the gospel with them. And then even down the road to be part of discipling them. And so I look forward to you signing up for that Bless Every Home prayer plan. It's very simple. It's very easy to use. And we have, about, I think, about nine lights, nine Bless Every Home prayer lights signed up from our church family. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had 150 or 200, even 300 families, households from Mayfair Bible Church signed up so all over this map, we could literally cover our entire community with prayer by name. That's something that we can do to persevere in prayer, to persevere in prayer. So let's focus on our purpose, Mayfair Bible Church. Let's persevere in prayer. Let's study our scripture, the scripture that God has given us, leaning on his word. Let's pray. Oh God, our heavenly father, we cry out to you this morning with joy in our hearts excitement for the future, knowing that you are doing something amazing, even in the waiting, that it's not a wasted time, but a time of preparation, of germination, of growth, even multiplication to the praise of your glory and grace. I pray, O oh God, that you would fill us with a holy zeal to proclaim your good news, to pray, to dive into your word. 
I pray that you'd lift up those who are discouraged or depressed or weary or even losing hope right now, that you'd give us all a renewed hope and increased faith to see and believe that you are doing something like something we have never seen before in our lives and in our church and in our community and in our world. We confess that our eyes are often veering off the path, that our hearts are prone to wander. Lord, we feel it, prone to even ignore the God we love. So this morning, take our hearts, so take and seal them for thy courts above. Help us to have an eternal focus and our feet grounded here on earth to be walking in step with your mission praise of your grace. In Jesus' name.